recording. Hello, hello everyone. Dr. Shirley here. I am so excited. Another segment of being black in Virginia. You know, talking about some hard topics, some real talk uh, topics some real scenarios, talking to real life people, you know, real life, you know, real people, not actors, not entertainers, real people with real jobs in different parts of Virginia. And I just want to bring attention to the negative that people face. I want to bring attention to the hurts and the pains that people are facing and how we are going about doing something differently. We are going about making a difference, a positive difference while still dealing with real life. And what we are going to do this evening, I have a special guest. I do indeed. I have David Washington and I want to thank him for coming and sharing with me. David, introduce yourself, please. Please introduce yourself. Go ahead, David. Well, Dr. Shirley, thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be on the show. Um, David Washington, I'm a resident of Northern Virginia. Um, I've been living here now for close to 16 years. Um, and I am employed by a major Fortune 100 IT provider where I lead uh, global um, strategic outsourcing engagements, basically taking over IT operations for major corporations around the world. So um, I am a was born in New York, reared in South Carolina, educated in Texas, and uh, employed nationwide. <laughs> so that's a short story <laughs> of myself. Um, married, I reside in Northern Virginia, and I have two boys, um, and they are in middle and high school. So um, that's my contribution to society, and <laughs> hopefully, uh, you know, we can have a great dialogue, and I can uh, give you some insights from my perspective as well. Absolutely. And I do want to thank you for taking the opportunity to come and share your insight. Because one thing that I know is that you're a historian. You, well, um, that is something you like to do. You you call it your hobby, <laughs> but you know, it, you're still good at it yeah, and so forth. So I, I want you to share with us, you know, there's a lot of things that people don't know about the successes of Black people. Right. And so at the same time, some you know, when people think about black people, they think about slavery, they think about segregation, they think about um, the poverty, the lacks, the how we're bums, you know, our kids go to jail, you know, right. and here you are, here I am, we are thriving, successful black, black Hispanics, we are thriving and we are being successful. We are not what the negatives stereotypes are shown on television mm -hmm. and it's important that people understand there are a lot of successful black people yeah. and we work hard yeah. so talk to me about some of the history it, you know help our young people know and learn that you know what it's okay to be black it's okay to be a black hispanic because you know what they're good people they're they're hard working minorities like you and myself and your wife you know they're hardworking people, and we are making a positive difference. Talk to us. Well, it's absolutely true. I mean, when you talk about just from a historical point of view, and we all know the story of what they say when Blacks arrived in Virginia in 1619, you know, from that very moment, we were contributing to this greater society. It, it was the foundation of making it prosperous, especially in Virginia, which in its time was kind of like the industrial power of the United States. It was an agrarian society. And this is where the money came from over time. By the time the revolution came about, it had a very powerful voice. In fact, Virginia, as we know it today, has changed in its geography because it at one time included West Virginia and Kentucky. And that's how far it went out west. So when we think about the people who had to make that an industrious enterprise, it's these people, these brown and black people, indigenous peoples that were transferred from one continent to, the, to another and then became the soul of the nation. So when we talk about, you know, how that evolution transpired, we talk about a very arduous journey, but one that was determined 
right? While those folks who were our forebearers didn't bear the fruit, it built a work ethic. And it's very strong in our culture because we recognize that it didn't come without a severe price. You know, the blood price was paid for that. And so while you are walking the duality of the color line, kind of like what Du Bois once, you know, talked about in his works, especially in the book that he wrote, The Souls of Black Folk, around the turn of the last century, he talked about the double consciousness that we had to exist within our own world, but then also the greater world. And I think it has made us a stronger people with a very rich cultural story and um, a significant contribution. More specifically, when we talk about those pioneers that really opened the doors to where you and I sit, um, when you're talking about these folks that, you know, were trailblazers, you've got the Hampton, Hampton mm -hmm. Institute. I know that was a big debate between Du Bois and, and Booker T. Washington, whether we should focus on vocational aptitudes or academic, but we needed both because we were a people evolving out of a very tumultuous time in this country's history. The other thing that people have to remember is that we are a people who were not valued as even human at the founding of the country. You know, three fifths were, was our standing. And that was for political reasons because the population of blacks were so strong in the South, they wanted the political cover of representation in the House of Representatives, but they didn't want to afford us the benefit of the vote or any of those rights that came along with it. And then you find that in our story, we had to fight for those rights, um, both in the cotton fields and the battlefields and the polling lines and buses, you know, the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments were the civil war amendments that were passed that gave us citizenship, the right to vote, all of those things. But yet you still had to wait until the sixties to the voting rights acts of 64 and 65 and the civil rights act in order to get it codified a hundred years yet again later than it was actually implemented into the constitution and countless of court cases in between from you know Dred Scott to Plessy versus Ferguson to Brown versus the board and so on so now we are here and so the question is what are we going to do with here and what does that mean you know the thing that I, I wish that we often spend some time investing in especially black and brown people is stop looking at the battle or the differences that we have within our race and focus on the strength and the contributions that we have. You know, when I was a college student, one of the studies I did for the National Science Foundation was racial differences in voting behavior. And what it, what it illustrated, which many scholars already know, is that in this country, you know, people who are immigrants who come from you know, slave legacy, have a very strong family tie. Um, what some people might call culturally conservative. And this isn't going into the political ideology. This talks about love of family, strength of religion, those type of things. And over time, what's happened is we as individuals have allied ourselves politically one way or another because of the agenda items that address our group. So at one time in this country, Blacks that could vote voted Republican. Then that changed to mm -hmm. Democrat because of the, the agenda items that switched. What I would tell folks of color to focus on now is think about what's important to your community. The political aspect is one piece of it. But what you started by saying is we have phenomenal figures in our community that we need to re-embrace and support and then use those folks to be the catalyst for the changes that we want. Because the way in which things are lined up today, while we've gotten integrated more and we've gotten more opportunities, that focus and that excellence will only come if we hold ourselves to that next standard and promote those who can lead the way and let them be the bearers and explain how they have gotten there and, and go through the blueprint for that uh, roadmap. Thank you for sharing that. And in thinking about all of that information, which I'm sure a lot of people, and I mean a lot, including our people, did not and were not aware of half the stuff that you've already shared. What would you tell some of the young people to make it, you know, that are struggling to find their place or who just don't care anymore? They're like, well, it is what it is. It is the way it's been. It, you, you know, can't really do anything. I can't get a job. I can't do this. What would you tell them? Because I know I've always said, 
education, education, education. Don't let anybody stop you from getting your education. Education is the key. It is the foundation to everything. All of my mentors have always said education. My family being from the Caribbean, it's always like education, education, you know, and to me, sometimes it's sad that education is not pushed even harder to ensure that even though your school or wherever you go, you might, your kids might not be getting the best, that parents aren't doing more or families are not doing more to ensure that their children are getting the absolute best. But most of all, young people are not fighting for their own education. What would you say to all of that? Yeah, and that's, I, I completely agree, agree with you about education. I mean, first and foremost, most, that is the foundational element because where there is no knowledge, there can be no growth, right? If you don't understand how to access or to, um, to um, really synthesize the world around you, then you're gonna be a fixture in it instead of an actor in it. You're just gonna be part of the furniture, right? And people will move you, take you, drop you off, throw you away, right? So you've got to decide on who you're going to want to be. Do you want to be a rock, an inanimate object, or something that's just there for the scenery? Or are you going to be someone that changes location, changes actions, change environments? That requires that you engage. And the only way you're going to engage is, is to develop some type of knowledge. One of the analogies I told my 11-year-old son is I said, you know, in the world, there exists data. There's just points of information, data. So then it has to be collected and put together to build information. Then that information has to be assembled even further, right? And then to become knowledge. Then when you apply knowledge with experience, it becomes wisdom. You have to begin with the very basics. And I think so many young people today are looking for the shortcut because of some of the images that have been placed upon them about what success is. And it has not become popular anymore to think about what that hard work is. You know, when you look at people who start these major companies like Google or Tesla, they were immigrants. They were people who came from folks who had nothing. And by that second or third generation, they were something. They were the leaders and the captains of the industry because they had a work ethic that was, this is success or bust, right? And so you go all in. And I think, unfortunately, we as parents are partially to blame because, because we don't want them to struggle the way that we once did. We sometimes pacify and enable them with things that were milestone achievements, even for us, you know, um, cell phones and, you know, video games that cost hundreds of dollars and shoes and all those types of things. Your child won't live a, live a lesser life if they have a less expensive phone. Um, but, you know, all of that cachet that we want to afford them, I think <laughs> sometimes damage the psyche. What happened for me was, you know, as a young kid coming from the Bronx going south, you know, I had grandparents who valued education. They were not graduates of high school, but they knew what the power of that education was. They knew what they had fought. They were civil rights people. They had, you know, stood on the line. They had protested. They had, you know, gone without they, you know, were involved in their communities. And so when they had grandchildren and children, there was like, there is no option other than this. So when I would go over to my grandparents' house and do chores. And when I got done, my grandmother had a, a set of black Encyclopedia Britannica. I can remember them. They were black and beige. I don't even know if they're in circulation anymore. And she would have me read those. <laughs> I don't know, to be honest. She would have me read those and write her a report. And I didn't know until years later how well she could even read them, but she wanted me to present them because she knew that not only is it good to formulate good thoughts and be able to communicate, you have to stand there and express it and you have to be able to. So those soft skills that I began to develop just in her house when I was visiting with her then fed my desire to do other things, youth groups and churches, debate teams and schools. I became the captain of the debate team, went to national competition, all those things, you know, ROTC, building leadership. We have to begin to know that it's more than just sports and entertainment that we need to expose our children to at a young age. We need to give them the foundational block so that they can negotiate their own sports deal if they happen to be such that they are athletically inclined and academically gifted. Or if they are, you know, 
um, musically talented or if they have you know acting skills they also have the business sense and the world sense to understand how to decide if they're getting a good deal or not those are life skills and i think it's our job as parents as leaders um, to to make sure that those kids achieve those rites of passage the same way that you know somebody wants to have a 16 party a sweet 16 or a 15 you got to say, what's the checklist? How am I preparing that child? Do they understand what debt is? Do they understand what credit is? Do they understand how to balance a checkbook? Or if not a checkbook, how do they should look at their um, electronic accounts or their cash app or whatever they're using, you know, their PayPal. You know, how have I taught them what the difference between a want and a need is? Have I helped them to understand that when they get money, how they save for their future out of part of that and how they deal with their obligations before they splurge on something that they want? You know, have they have they been charitable? Have they learned to be charitable? Have they learned to give service? You know, have they volunteered? Do they provide service? Even if nobody else is watching, are you building a rounded person that when they are an adult, they can come and care for you because they have learned that compassion. They understand that obligation. So we have to build that future model of who we want, not because the greater society says you follow the book and a manual, you are leaving your legacy here. And what legacy are you leaving is the question you have to ask yourself. If you want there to be a strong you know, culture of you know, black and brown people, who and what did you do to help make that culture before you left this earth, right? And those are responsibilities that we own. So I think that we're now at a place where we can't say we don't have the exposure, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the access. Now, the system has still got its flaws. I'm not one of these people that are telling you racism is gone, it doesn't exist. You know, a lot of people will say, well, blacks can be racist too. And I say, well, time out. Racism is about power, right? All people can be prejudiced. We all have prejudices, rich, poor, all that. But racism means that you have the power to control or implement something in my life because of my race. You can stop me from getting a loan. You can stop me from getting a job. You can impede my education. You can change where I live. You can limit my opportunities. Structurally and institutionally, that's racism. Prejudices, I don't like him. You know, what can that do? Nothing other than issue your opinion. So we've really got to be particular about our actions and our observations and what we see and do. Now, talking about racism and prejudices, mm -hmm. you know, some, a lot of people do not believe that it exists, despite and the things that we had experienced. And I've shared my story before that, you know, I have experienced some hardships because I simply look mm -hmm. like I do, you know. Yeah. What group do I really belong in? Right. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, people see me, they say, oh, she's Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. Then people, when I tell them, oh, no, I'm Haitian descent. They're like, oh, then, you know, she's this or she's that. Then they hear me speak. Oh, she's like, oh, she's strong will too. Oh, my God. Yeah. You know, so there is like, uh, 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 okay, this woman has a voice, you know, and that becomes an issue, you know, and mm -hmm. then it's like, you know, well, we don't like her here or whatever the case may be. And throughout the years, I've had to just fight, fight, fight for, if I want an advancement, I fight. And, you know, I, I push, I, I become very perseverant to the point where sometimes I don't know when to stop because it's like, okay, is this a, a normal obstacle or is it just something again, an obstacle because of how I look and of who I am? So I always teach children. I taught my kids, no matter what. I know people used to say, and uh, Black parents used to say, you got to work 10 times harder. I tell my kids, I said, nah, you got to work 100 times harder. Your yeah. goals, you constantly have to have goals that nobody can reach. And, yeah. But you're going to reach it because of the fact that you're not going to give up. You're yeah. going to fight till you can't fight no more. Simply because of the fact, do not give anybody a reason people are all find a reason to judge you ridicule you hold you down and then you got to do what you need to do and you got to stand for what is right treat everybody it don't matter if they black brown look like you don't look like you don't treat people the way they are treating you you know and so those are just some of the things that i know i've gone through and i've had to do what would you say 
have you ever experienced racism? And I know some people look at you but like, oh, he's working on Fortune 100, you know, and oh, he a big dog and all this. And he don't know. He don't know the struggle and all this and all that, especially those are people who are not there. What would you say? Have you experienced it? And how have you overcome racism and prejudices? Yeah, I think you you, you gave them a, a, a great amount there. And um, yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. And how did I achieve it? Um, you know, when I was a, when I was a young kid, like I said, I, I I moved south, and I had a little bit of a New York accent, and maybe a little bit of a lisp as well. And um, I had an older sister who was born in England. My parents were in, a, in the military at one point, and so we were a little bit different when we moved south. And so already, we were in a, an environment that was not as diverse as the rest of the country. Right? You're talking about, you know. Um, you know, early 80s in, in, in South Carolina, you got to keep in mind that schools really hadn't followed the desegregation um, plan that they should have after Brown versus the board in 54, because the court had said with all deliberate speed, which meant they didn't do that until the mid 70s, right? So you're still mm -hmm. just a few people generation in to them just having fully integrated schools, especially on the middle and high school level. So I went to a predominantly African American um, elementary school. We didn't have the funding. We didn't have the best books or special programs, but it was my um, third and fourth grade teacher who recognized that, hey, this kid speaks a little differently. Maybe he is um, one that we can offer up to take the gifted and talented exam. So I took the gifted and talented exam and, and I passed it because they never showed you the scores back then. You either enter or you're out. So by fifth grade, I was in the gifted and talented program. So what did that mean? It meant that our school didn't offer it. So what did that mean? That mean, meant that they bust me several times a week from my predominantly African-American school to a predominantly white school to be in that program where I met someone who became one of my lifelong friends. And to this very day, you know, she's gone off, become an anthropologist, helped open the Smithsonian, that kind of stuff. But the, um, the point is, we came from a very um, low income, rural black community but yet, because of some of the things that I told you about before with my grandmother and my parents and other family members, they instilled in us an ethic that said, like my grandfather used to say, just because you may be poor doesn't mean that you're stupid. You know what I'm saying? You have to then take those gifts and opportunity mm -hmm. afforded to you and make the most out of it. And as a result, I was able to continue down that path and get involved and do other things that led to opportunities. And so by the time... I reached high school, I was able to get a couple of full scholarships to schools and I took the one in Texas where it even opened more doors. Now, once I got there, you people made a lot of assumptions, right? Like just when we're talking here, oh, so you must've come from some money or your parents must've been able to put you in the best schools and all that, or they instantly assume you don't belong there um, mm -hmm. by your own merit. Okay, so what did you do to get here? Or how did they get you in? Or the first question is, so do you play football? No, I didn't play football. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. But those are some of those subtle, you know, um, low expectation biases that they bring to the table when it's about you and your abilities to be here. Um, and also, I would say that it's not just, you know, um, that they don't expect you to be there. Now it's you took somebody else's spot to be there. It's almost like when they talk about the inclusion, it means that one of my people had to lose something for you to participate. I said, well, when you play a zero sum game, of course, that's how you think the rules are set when you should look. One of the things I fought when I was a student for was we studied about funding for education in the state of Texas. And the state of Texas is a very interesting system. And I'll get back to Virginia. But in there, they have no income tax. So when they fund education, it comes from everything that is taxed in the state, whether you're in a rich community or not. So when a kid in the south side of Houston buys a snicker bar, that tax money goes into education. Well, if the state of Texas is 17% African-American or 30% Hispanic, that should be the representation at all of your institutions around the school, no less, because these people have equally contributed financially to that franchise. So why are you having a 2% African-American you know, um, enrollment at uh, Texas A&M or the University of Texas or a five or 6% Hispanic enrollment? 
and you have all these satellite campuses, but your most prestigious campuses, you don't have that same representation. So it's those type of subtleties that we have to still fight for because although the education is being given, at what level is it being given? And that's important because those rooms afford opportunities to happen, networks to be built, future people that you've seen that with the Ivies and the Harvards and all that, they've got that on top of that. But in all of these things, we need to make sure that when we have folks who are qualified to be in the room where it happens, kind of like from Hamilton, in the room where it happens, that we have seats and chairs. Now, there is something that's bothered me a little bit, and you mentioned it, that I think that we have to be honest about in our community, too, is that we do some self-division that isn't needed and isn't prosperous either, right? So we talk about looks and colorism and those type of things, and these are real problems, and that's part where I say we have to clean up our own act, too. You know, and it's not about somebody else giving us the checklist. We have to provide the checklist and say, that's not acceptable for what we are trying to do in our community and hold our standards higher once, like we did before. You've seen the movies where they try to capture it, like the great debaters or other things where people have already condescended to you in all things that you do. But when you have control over your environment and you are producing your future leaders, you hold them to high regard because they're capable of reaching that if you show them that standard. Now, back to the colorism. You and my wife look similar, <laughs> but, from <a> different, <laughs> but from a different point of view. And she has um, Creole roots, right? Her family's from New Orleans, that type of thing. But when we talk about Black people or Hispanic people, when we talk about that diaspora, it is just a much larger thing than nationality. And that's what I try to help people understand. You can be racially Black, but ethnically something else, right? There's mm-hmm. difference between Absolutely. ethnicity. Mm-hmm. That's why they say, well, Black, Hispanic, or not, but but if you're not black Hispanic, it doesn't mean that you're less one or the other. It's just that that's an ethnicity that's added to your mix, right? Mm -hmm, Because of mm -hmm. how people have been distributed. You know, if you look at the transatlantic slave trade, you know, from the Southern part of Africa, the Portuguese and the Spanish mastered that trade well before the English. And, you know, they had South America and the Caribbean covered with Mm -hmm. black souls who eventually, you know, integrated with the local um, Native American folks, the the coastal Caribs and others. And over time, you have this, you know, mixture of people. Now, one thing I will say about the Catholic church that's different than what the the European, um, the Anglo church did was they, in the U.S., were very strict about interracial marriages here, whereas in the Caribbean, places like Cuba, they sanctioned it because the church was more was more important. It was more important to be Catholic Mm -hmm. than they cared about your color, although that was still a caste system. So over time, the people integrated a little bit easier and you have mixed souls. And so it's okay for a person who's from a Afro-Caribbean culture to also embrace Hispanic origins because that's also who they are. Hispanic is a really bad word in some ways because it just means Spanish speaking, but it, it, it doesn't really capture the essence of who those people are. It's much more than just speaking the language, right? It's also the culture that comes with it in the Latino world. So, but I think Black- Absolutely. Blacks and others need to challenge themselves to grow in their understanding about how people of color have been distributed throughout the world. And I tell people all the time when they give me this argument about Kamala Harris or Barack Obama not being really Black, I said, you sound like an idiot. I said, does it matter if their fathers or mothers came yesterday or 400 years ago? When you land in this culture, you're Black. This is who you are. You are working within this experience and you are collectively, no, no no group is monolithic. We have a range in all things. My family, you know, has very interesting roots. I mean, folks are from South Carolina and along with Virginia, when you talk about the, the, the great migrations, which happened many years later, but when you talk about the actual slave trade, yes, you had the initial deposit of slaves that came into Virginia, but then for many, many years, more than 60 to 70 percent of all slaves in the country came through Port Charleston or, or you know, and down in Louisiana, but by way also through the Caribbean. So you had people who were already seasoned in these plantations and other places before they came to the U.S. I have ancestors that came from Barbados, right? But before they came from Barbados to Charleston, they had to come from Africa still. And they probably, you know, um, interacted with the people that were already in those islands and places too. So we have to get this purest, absolutist concept out of our minds and understand that 
our experiences and our cultural experiences, we are the representation of all those things that got us to this point. That's the manifestation. When you look at your skin and my skin, it is, uh, it is the hue that represents the history. You are the walking history, that double helix, that DNA reflecting all those things that came into your being today. And so, you know, my folks today, years ago, people would call them Geechee as a derogatory term or Gullah, but it's really a rich culture that retained a lot of West African traditions from the diets to the dialect to the crafts and making baskets and all those things because those folks were rice planting folks that were kidnapped, brought to America and plant rice <laughs> in Charleston. So there were real skills that were put to work for industrial reasons. So I say to folks, get smarter about not just slavery, but get smarter about the business of slavery and then go back before the slavery because your life and your heritage didn't start with that. You know, there were things that happened prior to that. There were kingdoms that had wars and they decided to sell off their enemies. Some of them became slaves. They still had to survive Middle Passage. Mm -hmm. They still had to bring Absolutely. their culture and heritage with them. They brought all of those things that eventually change the art form in the Caribbean, whether it's music, food, religion, culture, change the world in the United States, change the world in South America. All those footprints, all those things that were once considered bad are now cool. You know what I'm saying? You know, all of those things are cool and ingrained. Amazing in what time will do. <laughs> exactly. And then also what I said before, and amazing what they can monetize. If you can find a way to make profit off of it, Mm -hmm. it becomes acceptable a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I appreciate everything you just shared. Um, and I know some people will, it, it's going to be almost overwhelming, but I think it's <laughs> extremely important. I'm sorry. You know, uh, oh no, oh no, don't apologize. Because my thing is people need to be educated for things to change to be better. Right. Until we start addressing the hard topics and the hard questions, things will not change, you know, um, and I, I'll give a good example. I had to write a training document and people were getting offended because of the fact I put a question up there, something that I dealt with personally where a person had made a derogatory racial com a racial comment about someone else, but it wasn't supposed to be wrong. I wasn't supposed to be upset about it. Right. And I say, okay, anytime you make a racially right. derogatory comment about anybody and right. you think it's funny, it's not funny, right. you know? Right. Um, and let me explain why it's wrong. Well, in the training, I put in the information, well, if you saw this person that looked like this, what automatically comes to your mind? Right. And I'll give the perfect example. It's like, if you see a black person, do you automatically think that they're a thug? Do you automatically think that they are a criminal? You know, and it was considered offensive that I even asked those questions. And I was like, let's be real. People see me, they automatically make a, a reaction. People see a, a black young man with his hair uncombed or, un, you know, uh, uh, without the sharp edged line, without it being... a a certain way, automatically, that young man is going to be seen negatively, you know? And so we have to be real. Yep. Let's talk reality. Yep. I know I'm a realist. Some yep. people be like, well, you shouldn't talk about these things. Well, if we don't talk about them, when are they going to get better? You know, yeah, when yeah, yeah. I, you know, we're having worked in the school system. I was personally told in, a, in an area I was not welcome in because it was Trump territory. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a joke, but no, they, they meant what they said. Oh, they, yeah. meant, they meant it. And, oh, and I, I learned it, you know. And again, it was like, what? Uh, are we serious? You know, but I'm always supposed to be the bigger person. Um, yeah, it gets hard is, to be the bigger you know, person all the time. I got to be the burger up yeah, it's hard to be the bigger person all the time. And you hit on so many things that, unfortunately, I have a challenge when, you know, I live in the suburbs in a, in a mixed environment. 
And, you know, we joke all the time with our kids about you, you don't have a black card, you know, and, and it's, it's funny <laughs> because, you know, I got to make sure that, you know, they are not culturally deaf, right, to their mm -hmm. heritage. So we'll do things and we'll watch movies and I'll say, okay, you get 10, 10 black points for that because <laughs> it's just a way of helping them to remind them that there's another thing they need to see other than what they're being stovepiped and what's around them and also what's acceptable. But with that, I still have to balance it because I say to myself, I want to make them woke to bigger things than just the nice neighborhood that we see and your two young boys that they accept because they've seen you from birth and they've grown you. But if you weren't on the street, how would they treat you? Right. Mm -hmm. So I have to remind them of things that were taught to me. Hey, don't be running in public unless you got on running gear. Right, because now you just broke into somebody's house and stole something, right? Look like you're jogging if you're gonna jog. I hate to say that, that we have to do that, but those are the things that I have to make sure. Like they're young boys. And I know people have different beliefs about hairstyles and customs, but in my house, you're gonna be kept and groomed a certain way because it speaks to care and attention that you belong to somebody, you're somebody's kid, and they put time into making sure you're groomed in a certain way. That's not fair. But unfortunately, I live in a world where I have to make sure that there are fewer doubts about them because there's so many fears that are already stacked against them. And, and so that is absolutely true. And even as an adult, you know, and people see me, some of the things people don't know is when I used to interview for administrative positions and so forth, I actually would straighten my hair. Um, it's just recently. Recently, once I uh, went on my own, opened my own learning center, that I felt free to be more me, to be natural. Whereas in, um, the 20 some seven years, 28 years that I worked in the system, yeah. because of all the racism and discrimination and the sexism and the, you know, you name it, it yeah. was an ism, I dealt with it. And yeah. that's what people don't understand. I literally, would straighten my hair because I knew wearing it like this automatically it says if people never uh, felt I was good enough yeah. to lead or handle a, a some project. You know, yeah. I've been told I was too ethnic. Yeah. You know, and that because of my mouth and because I was vocal, well, I was going to be stopped from being being able to go into the next position of a being a administrator mm -hmm. you know these are things that people don't want to admit you know you get people who are in certain it's like clan and people don't want to change it because like you don't look like us you don't talk like us yeah. even me wearing a blue fingernail polish i feel freer now to be able to be myself because i'm self-employed Yes, it's a lot harder. It is. It requires a lot of work. It requires a lot of sacrifice. But I can be me. I can be yeah. free to be me, you know, and I can have these conversations. Whereas before, I couldn't talk about these topics because it wasn't appropriate. Yeah. The one time that um, I remember the one time I was told, you can talk about this. Well, it was held against me, you yeah. know, and I was like, oh, well, you can't talk about these things, you know, and it is unfair that you have to make sure your son if they're going to go jogging they they're actually gonna go jogging you yeah. can't wear sweats and so forth mm -hmm. you know it is a shame that i had to tell my black male son who is also black hispanic and no matter what you say you got latino in your blood you got latino in your blood whether yeah. you speak spanish or not That's you know right. when you look at me you, you know I, I i'm from a mixed heritage but yeah. also what people don't know is i also have white german blood in me yeah so does that mean I'm nothing. No, I am something because of all the heritage that is within right. me that makes me the beautiful human being that I am. And there, I have cousins whiter than some white people. Yeah. And so my thing is, a person can look white, but they also have, you know, mixed blood in them. And there are certain features that I look for in, in people, and I'm like, uh -huh. oh, they lie to themselves. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> you know, people. It, it's almost like to be black, to be Hispanic, or to be a, of a mixed breed. It is wrong. It is not wrong. Mm -hmm. And you said you brought some good points about we need to start educating ourselves and we also need to stop the um, the self hate, you know, within yeah. the, within the different racial groups. Yes. You know, um, just because somebody isn't the same shade. That's right. It's OK. 
it, right. it does not make the person bad. That's Just right. because the person's hair yep. is different doesn't make them bad. You know, some people say, oh, she got that good hair. Yep. Well, what makes another person's hair different, exactly. who's different from mine, the good hair? You right. know, their hair is beautiful. You know, my daughter doesn't have the same kind of hair that I do, but to me, she has absolutely gorgeous hair, you yeah. know, and she styles it beautifully. And people need to accept people for who they are and how they are, instead of trying to always look like somebody else and trying to be somebody else. You know, it is my firm belief that when we start accepting people for who they are and stop trying to worry about, well, where you come from? Why you look the way you do? Yes. Okay. It's different when you want to educate yourself and you're just curious, but not necessarily because of like, oh, she looks, she don't look like she fit in the white or the black category. Yeah. You know, oh, she don't look like she really looks, she fits in that category. Why can't we just accept people for who they are for being human beings? Are we not all human beings? I completely agree. You know, and I think human beings. I agree. And I think that this is the legacy of a caste system that was passed down to us that we began to believe because there were certain incentives within mm -hmm. our own race to have a lighter hue. Then you would have more access or more opportunities. Well, guess what? That is done. So stop perpetuating it. Why are you perpetuating That's a slave it? mindset? Yes. Slave mindset. Exactly. We are still in a slave mindset. That's exactly right. And that's why I was leading to is that we have to devent you can be free, but like when they tie an elephant with a heavy chain when it's a kid and only need a string when it's later in life, it's been conditioned that this is the circumstance that they have to be in. You have to break that mental shackle. And it's not the kids that do it, it's the parents that do them, do it for them. I remember once being in college where I dated a Creole girl and she said, I like you a lot, but I could never take you home because my grandmother wouldn't approve because you're too dark. I mean, again, these are things that we have continued to perpetuate that mean absolutely nothing. Now you fast forward that 20 years later and that whole story changed because the world started seeing people of different colors as value. And I think that that's the problem. It was always the, the situation in the Western world that the darker you were, the less valuable you were. And so mm -hmm. you can even still see evidence of that with the whole Meghan Markle thing, whether it's true or not, and I tend to believe her, Yes. Because when you start, I, I, I probably how, believe her. how dark will the kid be? That sounds like something would be. I know it happened in my own family. My mom, again, not trying to put people out there, but my mom's um, great grandfather was Jewish. My mother's father's name is is a, a predominant Jewish black name. You've, if you've ever seen a picture of him, you can see that he was biracial. But you can tell, though, but from the stories I've heard, there was bifurcation amongst the children and grandchildren about how dark they were and who could come over and who couldn't. Right. Because you're talking about what that means about prestige and who you have. And I tell people all the time, I said, listen, as I started with who you are is your truth. Live your truth, whether your hair is straight or not. Again, now, some of this I, I give to style. So if a woman wants to straighten her hair or make it curly, that's fine. It's whatever. But don't feel that you have to do it because society. But like you said, we had to at some point because we couldn't get any advancement. Right. Because look in the military until recently, they wouldn't let women wear their braids. Right. Because that's the natural hair that comes out of their head. But yet that was a problem. So I say to us, we need to be very cognizant of even the jokes we tell and the things that we say that perpetuate this negative is ism image within our culture, because, you know, whether they are the lightest or the darkest, there was a concept that they introduced called the one drop rule. And they didn't care if you had one. Yeah. drop. Mm -hmm. You were, you were that black, Hispanic or whatever it could be. So I'm saying you don't get to take that back now. Once we have assumed and we've, you know, we've accepted that our shades come in all different types. You don't get to tell us that that person is not light enough or dark enough to be black or they don't sound black enough or Hispanic enough. Or light. You don't get to make that decision because we've taken and embraced our people and our culture and we've grown with it. And that's the history and legacy that we've run with now don't do their job for them. And that would be one of my messages coming out of this is that for our folks, I think a time has come for us to sit and say, okay, while things are not perfect, we have moved forward in this country, in this Western world, leaps and bounds from where we were a hundred years ago. Now, what are we gonna do next? How are we gonna own that education? How are we gonna make industry and past legacy and wealth build and knowledge build 
so that we can all be where we once were before. This history that we read, you know, over my shoulder, you might see a statue of Egypt and the book of Egypt and all this knowledge and all these ancient cultures, people of color contributed to that, you know, over time got used for other things, whether it's calendars or crops and all this agricultural stuff that was done around the world, that didn't just all come out of one region of Europe. You know, <laughs> that didn't, and it's not to say that those people didn't make tremendous contributions in Europe either, but we have to stop ignoring the truth and we need to dig deeper as a group and understand those contributions for ourselves and stand on them and then be confident for our children because they don't know what they can achieve. We can show them the examples of it being achievable. And as you said before, those that came from nothing got educated and went all the way to the top and changed their industry and their world. One of the last things I'll say is I had the fortune to get the scholarship to school. And when I got to school, I started working in the admissions office. And I started asking the question, how are you recruiting students to come to these schools and where do they come from? So over the time that I was at this particular university, I made sure that my school recruited an African-American, a person of color from my high school all the way to Texas on full scholarship. And so by the time I left, I left three people there from my high school. And I said, now it's your job to pay this forward. I don't Absolutely. have a program or nobody's gonna ever give me an award for doing that. But I recognize that I was shown an opportunity and for me not to find a person qualified to at least get the same opportunity is a, is a disservice. It's like you climb the ladder and then you kicked it away once you got to the top. You know, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't build community doing that. And so like this program that you're doing, it enlightens people, it builds community because now the conversation is being had, like you said, with real people. And you get a diaspora of opinions, diaspora backgrounds, and now you can sit there and go, wow, there's a bigger world than I thought that was on my street or in my neighborhood or through experience, or how did that person become that? I couldn't tell you. All I can tell you is I took progressive steps. And when opportunities came forward, I took the opportunity to learn. You know, if I can compete to go to an international scholarship camp, I went, I met princes, I met all these people when they were young. And then I came back and I expanded my mind and said, wow, that's incredible because these princes that I met weren't from European countries. They were from African, Middle Eastern and Asian countries. And I'm saying, wow, there is a huge world of difference in a lot of these things. So exposure, education, you know, experiences. I would tell kids right now going to school, high school or college, try to do a study abroad. You know, mm -hmm. try to do something that gives you a different experience in real time and a, some, an immersive experience in another culture. You know, learn other languages. What's, what, what walks up right and only speaks one language? An American. You know, <laughs> we need to know other <laughs> languages. I, this weekend, I'm out in my backyard and my son is taking Spanish for, I speak a little Spanish, but I'm not that great. And I speak a little French, but while I'm doing it, I'm speaking in those languages to my kids you know, and I'm trying to make them practice and guess what I'm saying, because I want them to go and say, dad, I can now do it better than you. I want them to be fluent. I want them to be bilingual. I want them to be able to do business and operate in more than just in English, right? Because that's the world that they're going to walk into, right? So we have to prepare them, mm -hmm. truly prepare mm -hmm. them for what we want Absolutely. to take advantage of. So my question to you would be this. I have a couple questions sure. before we end. Okay. You know, I'm an educator. Yes. You know, I'm also a fighter. I'm a warrior. Yes. And um, what would you say to people who are not like me? A lot of people do not feel their voices need to be heard. A lot of people want to step back and are afraid to come in the limelight, to speak up for fear of retaliation or retribution. Sometimes I do wonder, hmm, is this going to hurt me? You know, uh, hurt my business because of the fact people don't want to hear these topics. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And we're in an e era where everything is sensitive. So what would you say to people about how to educate, but at the same time do something? I guess it boils down to me when we think about the 
I think about simple things like sacrifice. And I think about how dare I not try. And it may not always mean that I'm the most vocal, but it means I have to act. Sometimes we act with our voice. Sometimes we act with our deeds. Sometimes we may not have the courage to do it for ourselves, but if we can be a part of a collective or something that can help elevate the group, you can participate. So my first thing is to say, you have to decide to act. And then you find a role in which you can act. You may be the vocal role, you may be the supportive role, but you have to say to yourself, am I gonna to continue to live on my knees or die on my feet? Because you're gonna die eventually, no matter what, mm -hmm. from something or whatever way. But what did you do? Like people say, well, on the tombstone, it has when you're born and when you die, but that dash is in the middle. What did you do with it? You know, did you tread water or did you run the race? And for me, I choose to run the race. And, and that may not be headline grabbing or, you know, attention smacking, but I know that in my daily life, I try to do things that help to afford opportunities to my family, to my friends, to my community, but really help to change the conversation, you know, to make people engage in ways that truly challenge them to do something. And that's the thing, you know, it's like the old Greek plays when they wanted to evoke emotion or catharsis, you want to get to those heartstrings and make people understand that you need to emote, but let that be more than just the emotion, let it lead you to action. And then that action by itself will be a catalyst and it will come contagious because now that you've set it free, you can't stop it, right? It goes and it becomes and it builds momentum. And so once you've taught a child how to, not what to think, but how to think, that's incredible. Because now they may be able to do this in a way far beyond you ever did, but whatever they did with it might even have much more contribution down the road. So I would say, find the courage to act. You may not be the speaker, but you may be the supporter. You may be the facilitator. You know, you might be the leader. You might just be the example through your daily life and how you do things. You can be that quiet leader in the community that doesn't break the law, that participates and helps others, that looks out for others in the neighborhood watch. You have to invest in the world in which you live because when you opt out, others make decisions for you. And you become, you know, you become part of the landscape. You know, and it becomes very difficult to hear your opinion. When I hear us say things in our communities like, it doesn't make a difference, I won't vote. But then you see the last election. And then when, it, when the election is over, whichever way you choose, I said, what were you for? Did your mm -hmm. candidate win? Why did they lose? And if you can't say that you took some kind of action, okay, maybe your voting rights were taken away. That doesn't mean you stop giving a voice or you participate and help. But if you didn't participate or vote, I really don't care about your opinion because I, I hate to say that because you chose to give somebody else your choice, right? And that price, like I said before, was a high price that was paid. It was paid for in blood. And for you to just concede it knowingly, you know, is a problem. I'll tell you something that was a little controversial for me and I'll, and I'll kind of go here is that I believe in all the rights that were in that constitution. The difference is they were not intended for all people to franchise it initially. But the problem was they had to live up to those words and people put pressure in a lot of things. Even, even white people at the beginning knew that this was wrong, but they allied themselves and they got it changed. But with that, freedom of speech is one. People all the time talk about the second amendment and the right to bear arms. And I wrestle with this because I don't think necessarily you know, violence is the answer. And that's not where I'm going. But I think that if it's a right for you to bear arms, I think every person of color who's legally able to should exercise that right. You know, because then I think the conversation changes. What if they were all registered gun owners? Would you be so quick to do that? That doesn't mean pull out or brandish a weapon, but you would think twice because you would know, wow, they are just as enabled as I am. I don't have mm -hmm. leverage over them. Recently, I, um, you know, got my concealed weapons permit and, um, you know, exercised my right. But as I was doing this, I started to notice a culture that went along with this. A lot of the folks outside of the minority community, they bring their kids along. They educate them about this process. It becomes cultural. I'm not saying you want to raise a culture of people, but they're familiar with it. They don't fear it. They don't misuse it. 
And I say we are almost disenfranchising ourselves because we're not truly embracing all the rights of this country. And I challenge people to do that because I think your perspective might be a little different. I'm not telling you to go out there and buy up the stores, but I'm saying just get the legal paperwork. Make it such that you are just enabled as everybody else to exercise your rights and protect yourself. Because I'll tell you, that capital experience made me realize, you know, they are this this close from going crazy over things that are just insane. Not everybody, not, not all every, of them. Not that. everybody. And I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is that we all need to think about this kind of like you have to have two approaches. I think we need the Malcolm and we need the Martin. You need the Malcolm to give pressure. You need Martin to have that, that vision to say, this is where we can be, but it doesn't happen without all folks understanding everything that's at play. Because by the time Martin left this world, he also had a change in view. And he said, I think we need to push harder on a lot of things. And I think that I'm not telling anybody to be militant or anything like that, but I think we really have to apply critical thought. No, it is unhuman for anyone to accept a condition that someone else has placed upon them and to just, just wither away doing that. You know, the people of Haiti proved that. You know, because they did something that the yes, world yes. the world punished them for generations for doing. And that was they and asserted, still they asserted Haiti a, a punished them and exploited them. And guess what? The US unfortunately and exploiting worse now. Yeah. Unfortunately, the US had a hand in that too. We made their bases, we propped up puppet governments, we did things to honor our French friends by not supporting that country when it worse got revolution, but it was a democracy. And we went against democracy because of the color of the people that fought for it. And very much the same way that we in the US fought for our own freedom. So I say, you gotta think about all of these things. You gotta think about the agenda. And I think that the Haitians were the example and they were made to pay for that because they did the very same thing that other revolutionaries did just to be free. And so I think people need to just not you know, look at them and go, oh, they're so bad, they're so poor. You need to ask the question why they're so poor. You need to understand why they were embargoed, why they deforested their half of the island to survive because other people wouldn't trade with them. And on the other side of the island of Hispaniola, Dominican Republic, they have vast green forests. Forests. You know the story. But no, oh, absolutely, I do. I do indeed know the story. And the thing about it is there's a lot to that. that that's a whole nother segment, you know, that we could talk about. It is. But uh, what I'm saying but that, is we have to understand that diaspora and understand that. Absolutely. All of that is interrelated. And, it, you know, and it's your DNA that's presenting this now. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing about it that I think is sad is the fact that when minorities or a country like Haiti stands up. Yes. Um all the negatives are shown. Oh, it's a poor country. Has but Haiti, there are segments that are poor, but it's a beautiful, rich island. If it wasn't so beautiful and rich, why are there so many foreigners that are not from Haiti or of African descent that are in Haiti building up in parts that people are not seeing on the news and take so, but i'll of leave them. that alone and Absolutely. take advantage of them and, and when and by, yeah. yeah and when you know when the and, earthquake but i'll leave happened, that alone but when you know when the earthquake happened the industry still kept oh, working. Absolutely. people yeah. still made yeah. bad court rum on the other side of the island they were still distributing that throughout the world right mm -hmm. so yeah absolutely. Um, again that's and there's, the, there's so that, 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 that's a whole nother conversation that yeah. we could uh, talk about. And so, but I'm not going to go that deep. Um, let me go into uh, something else because <laughs> I know we're coming up to it our time. No, no, um, we can do whatever you want to do. We can, we can talk. <laughs> oh, okay. Because uh, I wanted to be respectful of your time. And what uh, would you say to educators? Okay. Um, to me, education is key and foundation. We have, in my opinion, and as I stated to everybody, everybody's free to express their opinion and their beliefs yes. because of the fact we had the right to speak from our perspective in our experience. My perspective and my experience is different from the next person. And yeah. so therefore we are not always going to agree. So the comments I will make, people might not agree. People might fully agree, 
but this is my opinion based upon my experience and my perspective. And that is our education system is severely flawed and that there are a lot of children, black and brown, and even, I'm going to say, our white children are not getting the best support in education because of financial. Nobody wants to talk about the financial piece. And really, if we want to take it out, we can take all of the, um, take the race out and just put financial there. And that is devastating. That because then that takes out the black, brown, you know, and someone, because it's all three, all three are negatively impacted. Um, But we're not going to go into the financial, but um, when it comes to the education system, we know it's a severely flawed and um, it's unfortunate. As an educator, okay, what would you say to those that are in the education system, both black, brown, and white? <laughs> well, Preparing our next generation. Our yeah. next generation. They are going to impact us. They are our leaders. Need to be treated with respect and dignity and challenged to do greater and to do more. Not, not 1%. All children shouldn't be raised or taught just to be workers. No, not 1%. We need to increase and teach all of them, allow them to make the choice. But, okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox. No, okay. I, I, what would I, you say? I, I think you're right. I mean, I'll first start with my sister is an educator in Virginia. Um, in, in, in the, in the uh, I'll just say the Hampton Roads area. So I don't want to specify which district. And she and I talk a lot. She's been an educator for 20 years or so. Um, I will tell you that as a parent, the easy button is to blame the teachers, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And there is some blame to be placed in some places, but that isn't my experience. When I grew up, the teacher was to be revered like an authority in the community, right? You didn't get a phone call from that teacher unless it was praise, all right? That that was not good. So I think some of it is my relationship with education because what we talked about before, it was so key in me escaping my situation that I know the power of it. And the people who administer education know that too, hence the problems we have with funding because they also know that you can change the balance of power if those folks are educated a certain way. But that's a different conversation too. So they know how the funding works with that. And that's, and to your point, that affects inner city kids the same as rural kids. And then then that takes a a little bit of the color situation out of it. But even with that, what I would say is I approach education with my, my children's um, teachers, first of all, as a black man, I show up to the open house and I speak to the teachers. I look at the syllabus and I make sure that my kids are prepared. And I tell the teacher up front, if you have issues, please call me. I want this to be a partnership about educating my kid because I know that they're only in their classroom. They're in there for long hours of the day, but I need to make sure they're prepared to learn when they get there. Now that means there's some personal responsibility that parenting has to do and that's another issue because it's like, like I said, I think mm-hmm. it's too easy to just put it on what happens in the classroom because so much happens before they get to the classroom that some teachers have to deal with. And now you're teaching to the lowest common denominator in the class. You have to now get past, you know, home life issues, you know, um, social issues, food issues, all kinds of things. So that already makes a barrier to learning before it gets started. So as a parent, my responsibility is to make sure that I'm constantly exercising mm-hmm. that kid's mind so that they can absorb what they have to do. But I also know that education works on multiple levels. You have that person who is dedicated to teaching the kid. Then you've got administrators and the political games that go on in that because now they've got these groups that want to care about which book is getting burned and how this is getting taught and how this is being learned. You know, And those are distractions that then bring another political angle into what can actually be enacted and actually executed in that classroom. I grew up in the world where you first find out if the teacher is competent, can they do this curriculum? If so, then they control their classroom. And then they have the right to make sure that those students can get to where they need to go. But when you start holding them to these, these standards that aren't realistic for the students that they teach, 
and then you measured them in some very archaic ways against those results, I think you're setting the teacher up and the student up for failure because then you're not putting that student in the environment where they need to learn that stuff. When I was in Gifted and Talented, I thought it was a joke because I what I was learning is what I thought all students should be learning. I didn't think there was anything gifted or talented about it. We have lost you. And um, like I said, when I was Let's in that- pause for a minute. I think something's wrong with the- Okay, you can go ahead. I think our, everything's fine now. Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's a challenge though in that classroom because the teacher is fighting for so much. They're trying to make sure they can demonstrate they've taught well of, uh, enough different boards to keep their job. They're dealing with the problems that the kids come in the classroom with. And they're also dealing with the external pressures, the political pressures of that school system itself because mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what curriculum people want them to teach or not teach or books to burn and that kind of thing. So what I think is the parents have to really make sure that they have supplemented that kid's education and make sure they come prepared to learn. Now for educators, the biggest thing is, I would tell you, because I was a student teacher at one point, don't go into that profession if you don't have that passion, because you're never going to be paid right now what you do in that classroom. Mm -hmm. And, and you got to know that. And I know it sounds insane for somebody to know that, but I liken it to somebody who's in the military or in firefighting. You are doing a service that your heart has to be into, because otherwise you can do a lot of harm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, but then I can't take the parents off of this because you can't just drop a kid off that's unprepared and expect this person who has them for some hours of the day to wield miracles, right? You have to reinforce that. I ask my kids what their grades are. I look at their syllabus. I say, where are you in this? I check them for concepts. But, you know, again, I'm in a little different situation. I've had some education. I can do those things. But you don't have to be a college graduate to take the time to make sure that the work is being done. And then you also have to mm -hmm. say, if I've decided to have these kids, and this is my philosophy, what am I gonna look at to see if they're getting everything that the world can offer them? I, I don't like artificial barriers. The state of Virginia had a rule that you had to be five years old to enter kindergarten. My kids were born after the cutoff. So I enrolled them into private schools for kindergarten and then put them back in public school for first grade because the statute doesn't apply to age for first grade. It says that you have to have completed an accredited kindergarten. So now I've got a 15 year old whose birthday is December 1st, who just turned 15, who's in the 10th grade taking AP and honors courses and has a 4.178 on a 4.0 scale, right? And is in the top 10% of his class. Why? Because what I wanted him to do was first see that he could achieve it with his own acumen, to not put him in a stressful situation to make A's, but once I've shown him that he can make A's, I said, now you set that standard for yourself. That as your parent, my job is to make sure you keep attaining your standard. You can do that. And once he started to believe it, it was self-checking. He checks himself, he does those things. But that's what I'm saying. Some people say, well, you got it in your genes or you don't have in your genes. I don't believe that. I and I'll that. agree with you. I don't believe that either because I believe it's all about strategy and getting the child to understand that, you know, they are able to right. be brilliant. And that is the reason why with my students, you know, that I work with in my learning center, I build up their self-esteem by doing their affirmation, their goals, That's as right. well as letting them know, hey, you one day you're going to be leading. One day you're going to be setting rules and regulations that's going to impact me and your parents, mm -hmm. you know, and I need you to know you are that leader. I don't care what anybody says. You can do it. Yes. And then I'm trying to make sure that they have the strategies to be able to life advocate for themselves. And at the same time, that they are learning, you know, not just getting a grade, but they yeah. are learning. They are able to do it, you know, and show that consistency. Um, so... I, I do agree with everything you say. And something you said in reference to uh, sometimes administrators' hands are tied. I mm -hmm. remember being an administrator and my, my hands were tied. Yep. You know, uh, um, it's unfortunate that a lot of principals now do not have autonomy to right. deal with the situations in their schools. Teachers don't have the autonomy to teach in their classroom like they need to. It is the saddest thing, but yet we're supposed to be preparing future leaders yep. and everybody is more worried about keeping a job instead of preparing and teaching and fighting for what is right. You know, we have kids that 
it's it's a sad that won't be able to read and write and compute because of people more so looking out for their friends right. and not wanting to say, hey, they're not teaching or hey, this principal is doing the wrong thing. But oh, because he got a score, even though it wasn't legit, you know, he got the score. And so we're going to back him when really the people that are working hard are the ones being crucified or being beat, you know, more so emotionally being beaten and taken out of the system well, or being forced to be like, I can't do this. You know, yeah. I was like, no, we have to get back to what is, why are we in it? And if it's just to keep a job or to look out for your friends, then that's wrong. And, you know, I, I remember being, no, you're Go right. And, and, I, and I think in fairness to the principals out there, um, ways that I've shown my silent support, but not so silent to those principals is I know what their limits are. I My superintendent knows my name because I call the office and I tell them exactly what I want to tell them. And I give it a fact space. It's not emotional. It's not attacking. I start with right. here's here's my issue. I've seen this and I've seen that. Why is this not occurring? When are you going to implement this or when are you going to implement that? Well, did the school counselor? Yes, school counselor did this. They've done that. And that's not their issue. I'm noticing this because my kids have matriculated through this system over time. You know, I didn't just transplant here. And I'm noting that this is a flaw in your system, whereas I don't see that in my surrounding counties. So why are you not addressing this? You know, I, I put it squarely on their plate and I don't threaten them, but I say, well, let's deal with it this way. Or do you want me to get vocal about it? Do you want me to show up at the meetings and really express it that way? But I think this is something you need. And I have been able to affect some change that way. But I think that it requires, though, that partnership I talked about before. And it's not just a, you know, a ground level partnership. If you want those results to happen for your children, you've got to decide to fight for it. And, um, and I don't ask for things that my kids aren't capable of demonstrating their ability to deliver. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if my kid is in the 10th grade and the counselor has not talked to him about the governor's school or any of these other programs, why not? What mm -hmm. about his profile? He's an African-American student, top 10 percent of his class, straight A's, never made a B in high school, takes honors. Why am I not being approached by these things? Mm -hmm. I want to know. Mm -hmm. You know, don't. OK, fine. You got overlooked or whatever, but I need an answer. Because what I do know is what I said before, these are gateways. But for teachers, I say it's still a problem because they have a lot of pressures that they have now that I didn't see when I was in school. Mm -hmm. And it's just everybody wants to metric them to death. I get it. There is a need for some metrics, but you got to understand what you're measuring for and what, you know. What yeah, and, and I will agree. Yeah. And, and I'm a I'm a big supporter of testing because. Yeah. To me, if it's done correctly, you can yes. find out where the child is and what the gaps need to be corrected. In. But I don't want to digress too much into education because I know that is my thing and uh, I can go on and on and on about that. So I will come back <laughs> and back to our families um, as we're getting ready to wrap up. Uh, I, I would say I second everything that you say, but let's take a look at what our children are learning yeah what can we do to help them and encourage them and support them to get them to that next level you do as a parent do not need a college kids more than what you have what it requires is you finding resources or people that can help you and work with them to get your child to that next level because when we do that then we we are ensuring our next generation is obeyed. My aim is, has always been to ensure that my children are my legacy, surpass me, and I will fight and do everything that I can for them to be even greater than what I am, you know? And as a minority, I am respectful to all. It doesn't matter the hue, the shade, the hair color. So we do need to stop the inner hate of other minorities it's just because somebody's a hispanic doesn't mean that they're bad or you know they're chinese doesn't mean they're bad no we all need to look at each other and say hey just because you're different doesn't mean that you're wrong or you're bad or i'm wrong or i'm bad 
when we stop that hate of the hue of each other's skin or the shape of people's face or eyes or even the hair texture, when we stop all of that, looking at people's humanness and deal with that. Um, in reference to the children, I want to tell the children, you know what? It's not cool to wear your pants down. It's not, not cute under any, any circumstances. Um, it's not cute to degrade another person because they don't have the top Jordans. I'm going to tell you, my son never got a pair of sneakers that was more than $50. You there was that, no right? that kind of money. If he you wanted that, it, right? he, you know, he had to get a job to go get it. What is the $250? Yeah. Or beat up another kid for it to look at some of these kids with their clothes in a ridicule because they don't have the top of the line. We need to stop. But also, parents need to understand bullies, kids that are bullies, come from parents that are bullies. That's exactly we have too right. many adults that spread hate yep. and then get mad when their kids get in trouble. And so, I'm going to say, and then I'm going to let David finish out. How can we change things? How can we make things better? If you're a white person, don't condemn people who look different or who have different views or yeah. who want to have the hard conversation. It's not an attack. Yeah. It's not an attack to talk about race. Yeah. It's only attack when you attack somebody's um, character. If you're a minority, don't be afraid to speak your truth know your laws and your rights get to know your hr laws and yeah. your rights you know that's why there is eeoc yeah. i know eeoc i've had to use it a couple times <laughs> you know um know your laws and don't be afraid to use them yeah. um stand up for those that are afraid or have been beaten down so much that they don't have a voice anymore yeah. build up other people don't tear down children listen to your parents do your schoolwork get your education and those are my last words david what are your last words my my thoughts are very much yours and but i would go and say that you know when you talk about these children they are a reflection of what we put into them right they are a vessel that's being filled by the things we expose them to and the things we teach them. And we all are educators in some way for right or wrong and what they are exemplifying or what they model. They are all capable of earning. So what I try to do is I remind them, like you said in the beginning, you're talking to real people about real things, that we live in a real world made of real things. And that these people who are being disparaged are also contributors. When you talk about your electronics and what you're getting, they come from China. They come from Vietnam. You know, these things are assembled and manufactured by some of those very people. Your clothes, look in there. Where did where are they made? You will find things now that are made in Haiti, Dominican Republic, Vietnam. These you know what countries that others have said before, but yet our industry depends upon it. I think it was um, Ivory Coast that just said to Switzerland, they're not sending them any more cocoa so you can make expensive Swiss chocolate. We're gonna make it ourselves. I mean, I think that people have to decide to say, look, are we gonna empower people who don't respect us? Um, and then are we gonna reclaim our respect? And then if you've been in one of those traditionally disrespected groups, don't extend that. Don't keep that going to another group just because it was done to you. And like you said before, I've been in rooms before where a disparaging comment was made by a different race and because they viewed me as more American because you know Blacks have been here longer, more generations, you don't get to make a joke about an Indian person here in front of me. Because mm -hmm. I know that if mm -hmm. I'm not in the room, then I'm the joke too. You're not, gotcha. gonna, you're not gonna socialize that in such a way that people become desensitized to you think it's okay to say these things. Not around me. Mm -hmm. So, I think that it really calls that the parents must help correlate the world around us to the things that the kids experience and help them appreciate all those things that the people around the world contribute to their lifestyle and to know that they had to have some value for those things to come into fruition. I would also say that you have to use the world around you to educate and help to inspire the kids for what they can 
to achieve themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Don't just limit it to what you see in the United States. Look at all of what's going on around the world and say, you can achieve, you can do. These people did. They came here with nothing. By the first or second generation, they had leadership, business, wealth, because they decided that that was important, that their kids would be educated. You know, I tell people all the time, look at who wins the spelling bees. It's not American killed kids. They're sent, they are Americans, but they're children of immigrants because those parents want those children to achieve higher levels because they know what can happen, not just for them, but for the entire family when that occurs. So our history has said that you have demonstrated that you've attained what five degrees or more, but because you said to yourself, I'm not going to stop. Yeah, I do my research too. And so, <laughs> so I say, you know, those living examples, when you're in front of a kid, and you're, you know, in my position, you speak to kids and they go, the only time I ever see a black man in a suit or is in court or a church, you know, and that's the limit because they've not been able to be exposed to anything else. And it's not their fault. So I blame people like myself who don't give back enough, who don't make that image present enough at a level to where a kid can access it or touch it or interact with it or speak it. You know, you've got to get yourself in a position to act. And I think I said that a while ago, that doesn't just apply to teachers, but it's really those of us who have the conversation, who are cognizant and aware, who have had the trial and error, we have to provide those opportunities. And then at some point, it's on the individual. I mean, you can try all that you want, but once that earnest effort has been given, you have to allow it to be what it is, you know, and say, okay, they are going to make a choice too. And that's too usually later in the game, but at the earliest stages, it's not their choice. It's about what they're being um, exposed to, influenced by. And so that's what I would say is that the parents, the teachers, the leaders need to build this bridge. Um, you can't just say, put the kid in this environment um, and just let it take its place, you know, you know, through natural selection. No, that's, we're not living in wild kingdom in that environment. You know, the university, the academy, Plato, whomever, that's a learning environment. You are to absorb, take it in, and then later on demonstrate the fruits. And then I would say back to the question of what do you do with teachers? The best learning that I had was probably physics, where I learned that <laughs> make the equations real. Go to the high school stadium, drop things, you know, let the kids understand that nexus. Real between life application. Trigonometry and physics. You know, one of my friends from Australia went to one of these international camps. And it's ironic because 30 years later, he's the CEO of a company in Australia that I was doing business with through my company. And when we were having problems and um, they were like mentioning his name. And I said, this person, they go, yeah, how do you know him? I said, I've known him since we were kids. And this guy was in Australia. But what he told me was he said the way they teach there is they don't just do the book in the classroom. They actually take some time and do practical application and apply the science so that they can see where it happens. I think we need to really think about that. And then I think in general, what you said is a bigger conversation. We need to decide that there is more than the academic aptitude. The vocational training is also learning. And I think that we need to think about all ways that we can empower our kids to be productive. Like you said, not just so much focus on the worker class education. However, we don't need to omit that because those can also have higher levels and degrees associated with them too, because they are income earning opportunities, but more importantly, business ownership opportunities. So I think um, it's never a bad idea to keep exposing children to things that can become um, life skills along with academic mm -hmm. education. So I'm sorry, that's uh, a lot for me, but I think for a person who's black in Virginia oh, today, wonderful. they should learn that nothing is held up back from them and that there's a lot of folks out there who can probably give them insight on things they might wanna do. And in the end, we just all have to work together. Exactly. Both black, white, brown, Asian, it doesn't matter. Everybody must work together put aside your personal beliefs, mm -hmm. put aside the racial divide. When we are able to look at people as a person mm -hmm. and just say, that's another person, you know, 
instead of wanting to look at the race, the religion, the gender, the this, the that, the hair, the skin color, are you smart enough? Are you dumb? No. Let's get down to the basics and treat people with respect. Your we point, let, you know. Yeah, you, you hit it on point. I've had people of other races help me in times when people of my own would not. So you yes, can't, I have you, also. You can't, like you just said, you can't just limit it to that. You have to look at, you know, are we in or are we out? And are you demonstrating that you are ready to to execute when that opportunity comes along? And most of all, it start with self-love, self-love of culture. Yes. And self-love of um, the future. What do you want to see in the future? That's right. So with that being said, y'all, it's been real. It's been real. It's been real. Woo. David Washington, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you and all your words of wisdom. We are going to have to do this again. Um, but I do want to say thank you so much. Um, Absolutely. And everybody, this is Dr. Shirley out. I, again, as I stated before, and I'm saying again, let's have these open dialogues and not be offended. There's no need to be offended if you disagree with anything or everything that has been stated. Just respect it and understand it's another perspective of another person sharing their perspective, their experiences, and their beliefs. Let's learn to respect differences and go out there and do something positive with information versus negative. With that being said, Dr. Shirley out. Peace and love.